Good morning, good morning. Today's lesson is, I'm sure it's fun for everyone to look at and say, huh? <laughs> lessons from geese. I know that sounds kind of funny, but I think there's a lot you can learn from observing different creatures' behaviors, and we know that the scripture in itself has often pointed to nature for illustration and wisdom. We know that Solomon, in Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11, he directed the slugger to consider the ant. So if you turn with me there to Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, he says, Go to the ant, O slugger, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O slugger? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. So a few fun facts about ants. Because uh, this is how we're going to illustrate how some of these animals, or nature, can be found in scripture. So, I don't know if you know this, but ants can actually lift things up to 50 times over their body weight. Ants are very complex and organizational creatures. They, especially soldier ants, they will do everything they can to protect their queen, and even after decapitated, can walk around for multiple days. Even after an ant dies, it will pick up, it will be picked up by other ants, and it will be put in a pile of other dead ants. A soldier ant will even use its head or its body to block up holes or anything into which it will save the queen. It is also something that can build very extravagant tunnels. They are very complex in the way they build their cities and infrastructures and are, importantly, they are loyal to the death. So just knowing these things, how can that be illustrated through Christian life? How can we find wisdom and understanding through that? Let's, before we get into that, let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 26 through 28. When he's talking about looking at the birds and considering the lilies in the valley, we know that in Matthew 6.33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This will get, these verses will give you context on what he was talking about there. So Matthew 6, verses 26 through 28, when Jesus is talking about not being anxious, I'm going to start in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither soar, sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So Jesus is telling us, if we look to the birds, God is giving them everything that they need. So what are we anxious about? Look at the lilies of the valley. They are clothed. Are we not more value than they are? So these illustrations is why I decided to choose this lesson. Because geese, being birds of course, have a lot to teach us. 
So on the internet or in multiple different books, you know, you can find many different facts and lessons about geese. Um, there was a specific um, associate superintendent um, in actually 1972, so a while back. His name was Robert McNeish. Um, there was lessons that he taught that when you really look into them, they can 100% be applied to our relationships with one another in the church. So I would say our first lesson that we can learn from that, from geese, um, is that they practice synergy. So a few facts about geese. Um, as each goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the birds that follow. And because of that, by flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. So together, the geese are going to go a greater distance. And we know the geese, you know, in their migration, and we see them everywhere. They're always flying in a V, whether it be a small V or a gigantic V. And we know that the reason they do this is because together, as a flock, they are going to achieve much more. What is a lesson that we can learn from that? Well, people who share a common direction and that sense of community can get where they are going a lot quicker and easier because they are traveling on the thrust and the support of one another. So I know for me, I always do better when we're in a team. You can do a lot by yourself and the independence that you have is wonderful, but when you have that support and you have that, someone even just building you up or helping you get something done, you can always get it done faster, correct? That is why even as a kid, and I think a lot of kids are like this, you may be told to do something, and you're not always super motivated when it's just by yourself. But when somebody joins in to help you, a lot of times, the, for me, it always boosted my mood. My mom figured that out real quick. If she started something with me, whether that be dishes or laundry or whatever, I was always a lot more happy to help and I was more into it because I knew I had somebody there with me. So the principle of synergy would be two or more agents working together to produce a result not obtainable by any of the agents independently. So an example that is used from, you know, what I found is, you know, nitrogen and glycerin. Now, separately, they're not going to achieve the same thing that we know them as now. And you kids may not know this, but nitroglycerin okay, is actually a medication that they use for people who have heart attacks. Um, and it was actually created um, for, you know, vasodilation, but the nitrogen itself is an essential element of life. It can be found in the ground, it can be found in the air, um, but just by itself, it's not going to do that. And then glycerin, you know, you can find it from different animal fats and different things, and they make soap with it. And, you're not gonna find that directly. But when you have them together, it produces a completely different result. So when we explain how it is to work together, in biblical practice, we can see that by doing it in pairs or of, you know, two, two by two. In Matthew, no, I'm sorry, Mark 6, 7. Mark 6, verse 7. 
says, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. When you think about going out, these apostles, these disciples could have done anything on their own. But he sent them out two by two and he gave them these authority over the unclean spirits. Now I want you to think about what that would seem like. So... Let's say you have somebody, you know, possession isn't a huge thing these days, but let's say you had an unclean spirit, they're, in reality, they're doing, like, an exorcism on demons that are taking over people, or unclean spirits. To have that partner with you just builds you up further. It gives you that support, it gives you that edification, it gives you that extra strength, because you never knew, especially during this time, when the apostles were going out and they were teaching and they were doing all these things, the problems that they ran into were numerous. There was no way around it. They were going to encounter something. So to have that pair, to be able to not just protect each other, but be that support for one another, and let's be honest, who wants to travel alone? So the importance of just having that extra person and being able to be in a pair. I think the other way you can look at that is, you know, this is also one of the reasons we are joined together as husband and wife, because you're better as a pair. And that constant support and love and just overall guidance from another person can really just build you up. Another verse we can look at is Luke 10, 1. And it says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. The more people you have doing things, the more movement can progress. We've seen that in multiple different you know, areas in our lives and in the world when you have a movement that starts to gain traction. You are going to have more support, you might also have more opposition at times, but together you can achieve great things. So, we know that there were, you know, 12 apostles. There didn't, there wasn't always 12. Started off with one, and then two, and then three, four. And then we get all the way up to 12. Because the more people Jesus was able to have under him and follow him scripturally and be able to teach to the world, the more the word was able to get out. And he didn't teach people, or the disciples, I should say, that followed him. At first, a lot of them were not great people. They did not know the truth. They were doing whatever they needed to in their own lives. And you know, one of the most well-known apostles is Paul. And he was the biggest prosecutor of Christians. So he used people for good. And he used them even if they were not seen as good in the world. Because I'll tell you what, if you saw somebody that wasn't, you know, great, or somebody that you might have even thought was evil, and then you saw them completely switch, and then they used themselves for good, and they used that notoriety and that, you know, fame nowadays to profess the word, what might be they're going to be listening to? Last verse we can look at here is Ecclesiastes 4.9, where it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. We know things in pairs are better. Unless you're looking for that other sock, you never going to find. But pairs are better in so many things. When you look out into the world, a pair of hands, a pair of feet, a pair of shoes, a pair of workers, a couple, 
I'm not always going to say twins are better, but that's a matter of perception. But having things paired together, you can have a greater return because you have two people that are more efficient. So do we appreciate the wisdom of flocking together? And this, I would say, is closely related to the second lesson we can learn from geese. We'll go through two facts. It says, when a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of flying alone. Tell you what, if you're working with somebody and you have, you know, there's two of you, and it's been hard, it's been a rough time, and then the other one leaves, you figure out real quick how much more work you got to do. And I won't even say just, that's just for a pair. We, we've seen this in you know, our lives and work situations. If someone calls out sick, guess what? Your workload's twice as hard. Another fact is it quickly moves back into formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. Smart. It's, it feels that resistance. It feels alone. And what does it do? It falls right back into the group. And I would say this can be a lesson that we can learn when somebody falls away from the church. Now mind you, it's their decision to come back. But when somebody falls away, are we going out and are we making their life have less resistance? Are we continuing to flock together and having them join in to our formation? If we have as much sense as a goose, we stay in formation with those headed where we want to go. We are willing to accept their help and give our help to others. We have to be willing to accept help. If we feel ourselves falling away or we feel ourselves falling out of formation, are we seeking others for the help? Because where we want to go is heaven with everyone else. Strong Christians appreciate the value of mutual edification. In Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 14, Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We need to be there for one another. We need to be edifying to one another. Because it is easy to fall victim to this world. We don't want our hearts to be hardened by sin. It's, there's many distractions out in the world. There's many temptations. If we let them continue to take us down, we will be hardened by sin. We cannot let that happen. So to be a strong Christian, we need to value the edification that we get from one another. Please turn over to Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. That's Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Are we stirring each other up in love and good works? 
Are we allowing the world to bring us down? Are we checking in on each other? Are we showing love? Are we showing kindness? Are we preaching the word to others? Are we edifying one another in a way that we will feel more love as Christian brethren? Mutual edification occurs within the context of our local church. Are we feeling it here? Whereas a group of geese are called either a scheme, which is what they're called in flight, or a gaggle, which is them on the ground. Not a better picture than that. It's quite the gaggle. But what is a group of Christians called? It's called a church. Next lesson we can learn is that geese share the burden. Two facts about geese. It says when the lead goose tires, it rotates back into the formation and another goose flies to the point position. This is similar to pace lining and bicycling. When one gets tired, he falls back and another one takes its place. Are we able to do that in our congregation? I tell you, with a smaller congregation, you do feel the lead a lot more. There's, there's not always that chance to fall back and let somebody else take point. But we have to all know that we have the strength and God will never give us more than we can handle. But are we sharing the burden? Lesson we can learn from this is it pays to take turns doing the hard task and sharing leadership. Somebody is not able to lead all the time because that will burn somebody out. And if we see this happening, are we checking in on these people that we see leading and they're taking more of the burden? Are we checking in to make sure that they are doing okay? Are we checking in to see if we can help? Are we checking in to see if we can serve them by taking some of that burden from them as Christ told, tells us to? As with these people are interdependent on each other's skills, capabilities, and unique arrangements of gifts, talents, or resources. As members of the church body of Christ, we need to do our part. In Ephesians 4, 16, it's Ephesians 4, 16. It says, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The whole body isn't working. We have a joint, <clears throat> a foot, an arm, whatever it may be, is not working properly. <clears throat> Are we able to give all? No. I mean, we can see this from a physical standpoint. If you have a bad back, you're not going to be able to do things. If you have a bad knee, you're not going to be able to do things. Bad foot, hand, you name it. If those things aren't working properly, your body does not feel whole. So, too often we see brethren that get burnt out because other brethren won't help out. But how about you? Are you doing your part in the work of the local church? On to our next lesson. 
Two facts we can learn from geese is geese encourage those who lead. The geese flying in formation hung to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. It is unlikely to be complaining that they are going the wrong way. So, the lesson that we can learn from this is if you feel like one of us isn't leading, please honk at us by telling us how can we help and if you are falling out or you feel burned out, how can we get you back up to speed? The lesson we can learn from this is we need to make sure that this honking is encouraging and not complaining. It needs to be edifying and it needs to not have a negative connotation behind it. In groups where there is encouragement, the production is much greater. I don't know about you, but when I have somebody tell me I'm doing a good job or they, you know, give us a raise, which, you know, we all know how that works with jobs at times. But being told even by management in your company, being told by a person, you know, when you are doing something that you're using your skill or gifts, they're telling you that you're doing a good job, they're edifying you, they're giving you that encouragement. It always helps your mood. And somebody who is in a positive mood, it gives you more energy, it releases dopamine, it just helps your overall mental health, spiritual health, and it all leads back to having good physical health. The power of encouragement to stand by one's heart or core values and encourage the heart and core of others is the quality of honking that we seek. Be a positive honker. Honk, honk. Okay. So that should be purpose of our words or our honking. To build others up. That's what we need to do as Christians. In Ephesians 4, verse 29, it says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. When we talk, are we speaking encouragingly? Are we saying positive, kind things? Are we teaching God's word? Because if we're not, I think that's something you need to work on, as we all do. We're not perfect, and we're never going to be perfect. But that is something, especially with the new year coming in, let us work on. In Colossians 4, Six. It says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We are to be the light of this earth. We are to be the salt of this earth. Is our speech seasoned with salt? Do we know what we're talking about? Are we willing to give an answer when it is asked? Or are we following God? The best way to season your words with salt and to be gracious is by being in the word, following his commandments, and loving one another. Because if you act with love, your words will speak love. And we know that God is love. To give a bumper sticker another meaning. To give, as we see all the time on, you know, a bunch of different cars, honk if you're this, honk if you're that. How about honk if you love Jesus and his brethren? 
Are we honking enough? And I'm not just saying with, you know, of course the car, because it's funny. Are we honking with our mouths? Are we giving him positive honkings? Lastly, peace, care for one another. Fact. When a goose gets sick, wounded, or shot down, two geese drop out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. They stay with it until it dies or is able to fly again. Then they launch out with another formation or catch up with the flock. I didn't actually know this. But as you can see, geese care for one another. The lesson we can learn from that. If we have as much sense as geese, will we stand by each other in difficult times as well as when we are strong? This is another benefit in working together. This is a duty of spiritual brethren. Do we see when something's going wrong? Do we see when times are difficult? There are times that you will. But I think more often there are times that you're not going to know because people tend to hide that from others. Are we asking the question? Are we seeking to help and serve our brethren? Are we dropping out of the sky to love and protect them and guide them back to where they need to go? Or are we letting them go? and having them die spiritually. What does Jesus say about the 99 and the one? The one is more important to Jesus because they are the ones that fall away. Where the 99 righteous are still there. Yes, he loves them. Yes, he cares about them. But the one that fell away is more important because they no longer have Jesus. Are we finding those people? In conclusion, by our instinct, God gave geese the wisdom to succeed in their flight in and migration. By his word and by his creation, God gives us wisdom to succeed in our spiritual journey. So the lessons that we have from geese, we need to practice synergy. Working with one another as Christians, we need to have our mutual edification be beneficial to us. We need to be able to share the burden as brethren and not let one take it all because they can be burnt out. We need to encourage those who are leading and we need to make sure that we care for one another. And I'll leave you with this. If your honking isn't positive, if your words aren't positive, if they aren't encouraging, if they aren't showing love, if we aren't edifying one another, supporting one another, sharing each other's burden, are we at peace? No. It is our job as Christians to be Christ-like, to put Jesus first in our life, and as we go out into the world, let's preach this to others. Because through our actions, we will show people God by how we love and by how we act.
we know that by our good works we show love. We need to seek him first in all his righteousness and all the things and that he gave the birds and the lily of the valleys. He will give all of these things to us because he loves us so. So an invitation for anyone who is not